This episode of the Better Two Podcast is brought to you by Kitty Mystic and DM Needham, author of the Better Two Burnout series, which includes her latest releases of Fairy Tales and I Love You and His Love Just Another High. Hi, gang. Donna here. Thanks for tuning into the Better Two Podcast. Today's guest is Audrey Brinbaum. Audrey wrote a book which is actually kind of based on her father's diaries. It's called American Wolf from Nazi refugee to American spy. And she tells us a little bit about her father's journey. And we also talk about the fact that sometimes we're forced into taking a break so we can deal with things in a better way than if we had to keep going. So enjoy. Hi, Audrey, how are you doing today? I'm wonderful, Donna. Thank you so much for having me. So you have a book currently coming out, and this book is very close to home because it was something that I know you're a practice, you were a practicing doctor at the time, but you started this as a soul search journey, basically, because would I say that maybe your medical practice wasn't as fulfilling at the time and this led you on this journey or did something major happen in your life? Well, Donna, it was a mixture of a few things. I actually found my medical practice to be incredibly fulfilling. I was practicing for over 30 years um, as a pediatric gastroenterologist, which is very hard to say, (laughs) Uh, but I do my best. Um, I loved it. I loved my patients. Um, I had spent my first half of my year doing more academic work and my second half doing uh, patient care. And then... um, I think in 2018, things started to kind of uh, go, I don't want to say downhill, but um, my um, my father died. And mm. around the same time, I also had an injury that took me out of work for the first time in my life. I've worked, I feel like I worked since I was five years old. <laughs> I was a very hardworking family. And um, so I actually had had a ski injury. Um, and a week later, my father passed away. And I had to prepare a eulogy for him. And he had had this experience of you know, being in the Holocaust when he was a child and escaping Nazi Germany uh, fairly late, like in 1941. And I knew I had to tell the details, but I, I you know, kind of didn't remember like all the stories he had told us growing up. And, and then I was also, you know, recovering from this injury. It was was just a very hard time. And I remember my father had written down a lot of his memories in a a very lengthy, um, you know, he called it a book. It was more like, I guess, a memoir of a kind that he really wrote mostly for his family. And I kind of pulled it out and, and read it rather quickly to just sort of figure out the facts and details I could put into a, um, um, a, a eulogy, and I didn't really look at it again. I was able to prepare something, read his story, kind of marvel at the details I had forgotten, and then I, I put it away. And then I was off my feet for a couple of months and went back to work. And from then on, I was kind of like dragging myself into work. I was like, oh, this the first time I had never, I hadn't worked for a couple of months. And I was like, this is really hard. I forgot how hard it was to work full time. I had three kids. I was working full time. I I think like for years and years, I, I just had like these two pillars, you know, family work, family work. That's like all I could do. And there was really no time for anything else. So I kind of, I think that was sort of a, the 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 moment when I said, "Is this really what I'm going to do for like the next ten years, or is there going to be some other moment?" So I finally, it took me a long time, a lot of soul searching, to finally decide to leave work because I was so committed to it and it was such a part of my identity. But by around 2020, I January of 2020, I I, I decided to resign. I don't want to say retire. I was afraid to say that. <laughs> so I said, I'll yeah. resign just in case, leave the door open. Um, and at the time, like I thought, well, I'm going to do all these other things. You know, I uh, was music and art and ballroom dancing. And I don't know what I had a whole list. And then I, uh, like a month later, I found myself, you know, with a face mask on sitting on the couch in the middle of a pandemic and all those things I had intended to do really, you know, 
I had done them for, for, for a few weeks. So there were a lot of, I can't learn much ballroom dancing in a few weeks. But uh, and then I said, you know, it sort of all came back to me that I really I I knew, you know, back when I had read my father's book, I, I kind of knew in my heart it had always been my plan. This uh, story of my father's was so important. What he had been through was so fascinating, moving, emotional, and unique. I knew I was going to write it at some point so it could be shared with everybody. I, I knew it. it. I just had to give it some time, had to give myself some time. Right. And that's really what started this journey. And see, I have to go back to that moment of your ski injury and losing your father, because there's certain times in our life that we don't realize that maybe the universe, God, however you want to look at it, has our back. Because think about how, how much harder it would have been. Well, I know it wasn't easy, but think about how much harder it would have been had you been working at the time dealing with your father's death. I mean, that would have been a totally different process for you where this you had a little bit more grace. You know, I hadn't really thought about it that way. I just thought, wow, this is a bad year. <laughs> this is, this is uh, you know, because I really like was dragging myself, you know, on crutches mm -hmm. to a podium to technology. Right. It all felt like very like overwhelming. It was dizzying. The whole experience, it just, my mind was not clear. It was like that craziness, you know, with, with death, that sort of craziness, mm -hmm. you know, or we would say the year of magical thinking, Joan Didion would say, but it was a... Um, yeah, there was a certain insanity to it where you're not processing. And yes, I think also in medicine, particularly, there's this sort of dragging yourself to work no matter what, like you feel like you can't take any time off. Your patients are waiting for you. How can you cancel a colonoscopy for a funeral? My goodness, they're, right. they've are they been waiting six weeks. They already took the prep. <laughs> you know? Right, you right. Take, you know, you cannot take a day off. There's always been like a, a struggle in medicine, this sort of... Um, you even though you're promoting health, there is no self-care because you have to, you know, sick or well, you just drag yourself in. So yeah, I had this sort of forced period. And, and actually, you know, while I was, although I skipped over many parts, while I was out um, on leave, because I was um, not weight bearing during that time, I actually spent a lot of time reading through my father's story, which, uh, you know, really was an incredible story that eventually turned into my book, which is called American Wolf, um, from uh, from Nazi refugee to American spy. So it, it moves um, from one place to, to another, but it does come full circle. Um, and, you know, eventually, yeah, that was, uh, became like sort of a new mission. So I guess I'm and still working. <laughs> well, you are. I mean, you've just trans transformed your life because... I went from, I was in insurance as a claim supervisor and I had identified with that job so much. And then I was taken out because of an injury. And when you lose that identity, because so many times we are put into a box or given a label that we are identifying as you're the gastroenterologist. Yes, I can talk. <laughs> um, but you are, that's what you identified as. And you identified as a mom and you wore these hats and this is who you were. And when you take yourself out of one of those boxes, you suddenly have to rediscover who you are. And that can be daunting, especially since you resigned not too, too far out from the pandemic, because yeah, you had all these ideas and these dreams. For me personally, my life was transformed because my husband died in the middle of the pandemic. Wow. He was sick already. He was sick with long-term illness, but still all the normal grieving processes as you would go through, you couldn't. Yes, so right, yes. It, and there's a lot so of isolation it, too, all of that. Yes. So there's a lot of a lot of things where I think, you know, as bad as the pandemic was, and I'm not saying it was good in any way, shape, or form, it made us all stop for a bit, or at least most of us stop for a bit to really look at our lives and take stock. You know, they one of the odd things was for me that um even though like we were not seeing people um in a regular way it made me yearn for connections more and reach out to people more than i ever had before because i was so busy with seeing patients it sort of felt very fulfilling it felt like i had this sort of life with people um but i hadn't really cultivated um strong friendships in a way that i would have liked which i think since i've left work i've been able to do and have now this community which 
um, is so important. Uh, you know, again, looking back to my father's experience and his sort of escape, um, the importance of being able to rely on people and community and support was something um, that was so critical. I don't think he had as much of that as he could have uh, due to all kinds of interpersonal issues with his his family, but it was so critical to have that, um, to be able to survive even when he came here and started up again as an immigrant. Well, that's the one thing I was gonna say, there's a lot of isolation in your father's story because I mean, who do you trust? Who do you really trust? Who do you know? Especially when he, he ends up turning into a spy, how do you know who to trust? How do you know that that person that you think is your friend isn't going to suddenly flip the script and turn you in. Yeah, I think there is so much. I mean, for my father, it was learning. Also, I got to know him more after he died than during his life. I mean, I knew him in a certain way. You know, he's the dad and he had a bit of a domineering personality and a little bit of volatile personality that uh, could be difficult at times. I never understood where it came from because I saw him as a child. I was the child in that right. relationship. When I read the details of everything he had lost and lost again and lost again, friends, family, money, citizenship, um, it, it was so much loss. Then it explained so much to me about um, why he held so tightly onto things. And um so many things he hadn't really worked out, but it was so much easier to, for me to be forgiving um, and to understand like compassionately who who he was and why he was the way he was. It was very sad. I mean, I, I cried, cried buckets mm -hmm. <laughs> um, when, when I was writing, when I was reading his story. It was it was um, it was very heartbreaking. Um, I imagine I can imagine. And so and I think one thing even whether it be death or just as we age, when we are able to turn around and look at our parents as adults and, and as human beings, instead of dad or mom, we get a truer vision of who they were and why they may have had those reactions or behaviors. And we can then look at them and forgive them with grace at that time. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I think I had for yeah, he had been forgiven, you know, in the sense that right, I kind of right. harbor any ill will or anger. I mean, I had the, I think once I had my own children, I, you know, it was easy to forgive a parent for their flaws because my goodness, we were all flawed parents. Right. Um, but but I think that the the, the true understanding, uh, you know, it just wasn't quite there. Um so now I'm really excited. You know, the, the book is already out on pre-order and um people who've read it are seem to be uh relating to it really well i've tried to add humor not just uh it's not sad it's not so sad <laughs> it's uh it's uh it's got humor it's got adventure and action so um, i think it's um but most importantly as i want to i think it's still important to tell holocaust stories too because they're um you know the first generation uh survivors are dwindling and even us second generation survivors are, you know, uh, retirees already, you know, we're getting old. So, um, and for the younger people to learn, they need to hear personal stories, uh, not just statistics to bring it home, make it feel real. I, I agree. I mean, I remember learning about the Holocaust in, in high school and thinking to myself, how could that ever happen? How could we ever get here? You know, how did they ever get to, to that point? But then when I look at the world now, it's easy to see. Basically, and it's like, yeah. if we if we don't teach, if we don't show those human stories, and it's just all numbers that people are now saying are not true, which is BS, but that's beside the point. If we don't have the human emotion attached to teach the children or teach younger people that this is real, they're not going to learn and we're doomed to repeat the same mistakes for a different reason. And that's that's a big thing that I think most people miss. They're they're not looking at this is fact. This is something that really, really happened. And here are stories from people. Yeah, it feels I mean, for us, it's recent. But for kids, you know, 1938 to 45, it's an awfully long time ago. It's black and white, you know, I, I write I write his I write my books are set in the 80s. And I think it was yeah in 2020. 1980 was deemed historical fiction at that point. I know. 1980 was yesterday. 
I know. I and I'm like, what, what are you exactly. talking about? Exactly. I'm like, I was in high school in the 80s and you're telling me this is historical now. So it, it's, but we don't realize that. We don't realize how, how much, how much time has passed and how quickly it has passed. So for you to do this and share the stories, I think, I think it's a good thing. And I think it's a, a wonderful way of honoring his memory, but also enlightening other people. Yeah, that's my main goal now is um, personal enlightenment and enlightening others. <laughs> Still working on the personal enlightenment. Yeah, that'll be a lifelong <laughs> lesson, as we all know. It's a, yes. So are you are you planning on going to possibly schools to talk about this I or am, do a TED I Talk? Am. Awesome. Yeah, And then I also just I didn't realize, um, ignorant as I was, how um, little uh, I uh our, we, we have no uniform curriculum in this country on Holocaust education, nor even a mandate in all our states that there even be a Holocaust education. And even in New York, there's no clear-cut curriculum. There's just a mandate that we should have a, an education. But what that is, is really, you know, it's, it's um, the last legislation was in 2022, it came to the floor of New York State, and it said we should have a survey to study it. <laughs> That's, I know, I know. It's, uh, a you survey. know, the wheels of um, government move very slowly, but I think that maybe we can influence that. I Maybe I can influence that on a, some small level somewhere. I'm thinking, you know, I mean, there's, you know, there's. I could go into schools and I can tell the story that's something but i'm feeling like maybe i could do something bigger i would say so i i would think that if you know the, the old adage of if we don't learn from history we are going to repeat and we are going to repeat this if we do not pay attention i mean dare i say look at the 1920s and look where we're at now you know economic wise we're not in the same place but we are headed that way if we don't pay attention and that's the only thing i mean by that it's like so as easy as it is to repeat this we're already seeing this with certain gender issues and i'm not trying to make this a political conversation because we're here to talk about your book but there is similarities and i really wish people would learn from our mistakes well you know and, human, human nature remains the mm -hmm. same and that's why we make the same mistakes. And mm -hmm. so, you know, that's, you know, when we're bound to, but I think we can educate our way out of it. So I remain hopeful. I'm hopeful in young people. I think they just need to learn. They're basically young people. They they start out innocent. They they start out fair-minded. And I think- It's the, the outside influences that push yes, their narrative. Exactly. And that's- that's the thing as a, as a teenager, I, my, myself personally, I decided to step out of my parents' views. I am nothing like either one of my parents as far as their views. And I still have to warn my dad. It's like, dad, we're not going there. I'm not discussing this with you because otherwise Oh, it's not worth it. <laughs> no, no, you, you, it's just like, it's not worth it. Well, let's just, you, you're my dad. That's it. That's as far as we're going to go. I forgive him for his beliefs. I forgive him for who he is. But the fact is, it is what it is. And I'm not going to change my views to mirror his. Yeah. That's, that's, I get sad no, 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 when no. I hear about families that are ripped apart by politics. It's, uh, it's unfortunate. Uh, it is, especially because it's not something that should be so detrimental to a family, but in a roundabout way, what you were saying about your dad and maybe not having that support was still happening back then. Was it not? I, uh, yeah, I think that's, uh, that's certainly true. Yeah. Um, my, so my, interestingly, like my father himself came from a sort of, um, kind of a bit of a quirky family, which I thought, really added to his story a little bit that he um is is his his parents didn't have like the most perfect marriage it wasn't like the most loving relationship there was a little bit of strife um and i think that there were things about it that were amusing um you know i think his his mother felt that she had married beneath 
beneath her a little bit. She was trying to, I wouldn't say she was a social striver. She was like desperately, they were poor. They were desperately trying to, to make it just to the middle class. That was it. They're just trying to make it to the middle class. And they really like were um, working really, really hard to live in Germany. There was like a German dream. So similar to like the American dream here, you know, that if you worked hard and prospered, you could, you know, make it even a, in those days, even as a Jew, that was really tough, like, you know, to see equality. So in Germany, you could, um, you, you know, you could be in the civil service in, in Germany. That was unusual in those days. So the sense that there was equality that you could have as a Jewish person was very, very powerful. And, and so that's why all the Jews were coming to Germany, because you you could live life as an equal where you couldn't in the rest of Eastern Europe, for example. So they were all going west to Germany. Um, so my so my uh, my my grandmother and my grandfather they weren't too educated, but they thought, well, if they worked really hard, they could maybe they could maybe make it. So they worked really, really, really hard. They made it to the middle class and then came Hitler. <laughs> and everything was like, you know, you know, so when it came time to leave, they were like, well, we kind of don't want to because we finally, we finally planted our, our roots here. We finally made it. And so they were a little slow to pick up on the fact that it was time to get out of Dodge. And that uh, <laughs> did cause a bit of trouble for them in the long run. And then my, my, my grandmother was, um, she was a little judgmental of people. So she did um, burn some bridges which wasn't very, wasn't very good, but she wasn't, she, she meant very well. Of course she did. I mean, she, you, you do well. this, she thought she was doing right by her. And that's... She did. She did. And a beating or two, you know, well, <laughs> discipline, good discipline. Ba back then, you know, discipline, even up until I would say the nineties, discipline was a big thing. Old fashioned discipline. Uh, I went to school in junior high. It was a Lutheran school. I am not Lutheran, but uh, there was a paddle, a paddle about yay big with three holes in it that, yeah, if you did something wrong, they could take it out on you. Different times. Yes. I don't think that would be allowed even in private school today, but you know, maybe I'm wrong. Anyway. Did it make, um, you, more so did it make you more resilient? Donna, what do you think? What do you think? Or just I never met. I never met the paddle. Okay. I I kept my nose clean. I I did not want to meet the paddle. Uh, just the threat was enough to keep me uh, in check. So yeah, not that I, I have not been stepped out of trouble before, but uh, when a paddle was involved, there was no, mm -mm, mm -mm, not like that. No, sorry, mm -mm. no. Well, like, but that was the thing back then. I mean, it was. Sometimes, yes. So how did your, how did your father, and if you don't want to give it away because it's in the book, I understand. How did your father become a spy? Oh, so he, um, when he was in the height of the Cold War, um, we, he, I guess it was like just after the Korean War had ended, he entered the service. And because of his fluency in German, he uh, ended up being stationed in East Germany and being part of the mission, which was a, a spying, like every country had a mission and they all did spying. Um, and so he did so for the U.S. Um, and did some you know, pretty dangerous missions and um, would like photograph i mean they had like it was like a james bond they had like the little cameras and the little um microphones and and they did they took pictures of all the uh russian subs and equipment and um you know it was i think it was the time that he it was the first time that he felt really pr proud to be an american like he wore his uniform um like he's like armor because he'd gone back to germany and there was a sudden feeling of like what what about these germans are they all nazis what are they going to do when they look at me are they going to see right. a, a jew or are they gonna you know it was like a sudden shock to first go back like, he had wanted to go back because he had this homesickness but at the same time there was a great fear and to go back as an american soldier 
kind of assuage that fear a bit. Um, and he also felt important. And he had, you know, he had grown up with tremendous insecurities. I mean, he came to this country, he was left back two years. Um, he, he was despised when he came here for being a Jew, for being a German, they called him a Nazi. You know, it was, it was very awkward time and he, he had gone through a lot of hardship once he came here in a way you know there was a lot of trauma here almost as much as when he was there um so i think he sort of came into his own as a um you know car racing <laughs> um you know uh intelligence officer and found some romance and uh, so when he was able to come back to the united states though he had to kind of figure out again what was his identity because he now had was back to speaking german and to figure out who he was uh so i think for me the re the reason i put that in the book is also because America had done some interesting things they had let nazis back in the country because now they were so afraid of communism and so, again, there's just a lot of confusion about what our relationship was to Germans, to Germany, to Nazis. You know, just, it was like a full circle, created like a nice narrative arc. And for my father, for his whole identity, who he was as an American and Jew and, and a German. I, I think you bring up a good point, a very valid point that we never talk about. Because, you know, we always talk about America being this great melting pot. We don't talk about, you know, it, it makes it seem like, oh, you just come over, we invite you in and here, everything is wonderful for you. But the truth is there's always some kind of stigma. You're always getting some kind of stigma. You know, we may act like we welcome everybody here with open arms and I'm going back before the last 10 years, but there's always still that trauma. There's still gonna be that trauma of you leaving your home and hoping that even if you just move, I moved from one, part of a state to another and there was still trauma there because there was different cultures even though it was the same state i went from new orleans to shreveport okay new orleans was known as a party town shreveport at the time was very much a conservative baptist kind of kind of town so there was still this trauma of well you you sound like you're from new york you don't belong here da, 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 da. you don't dress like us you don't talk like us and it was just so even Donna, on and that's minor scale and this is going to sound ridiculous but when i moved my practice from Mount Sinai to <laughs> Mount Kisco Medical Group, I felt so displaced. I'm standing in the office. I'm like, what am I doing here? This office doesn't feel right. You know, you feel this complete sense of displacement. That's so minimal. But I mean, I, I right. understand the feeling of like complete displacement. But when what I didn't know, my grandfather had some serious mental difficulties mm. when he moved. I did not know that there is now like a DSM, what are we, five, DSM, five, you know, one of those psychiatric categories on you know, the big textbook of psych psychiatry called uh, Ulysses syndrome that describes a specific psychological syndrome of, for immigrants of displacement, bewilderment, depression um, of the em em immigrants. Um, so it has its own category now because the, my, my grandfather had terrible depression. And I think my, my family thought that there had been some bipolar issues in some family members and they thought, was he bipolar? They didn't know, you know, that at the time, but it really is something specific to the immigrant experience. You come here, you don't know the language, you don't have connections. You may not be living in a community where people speak your language. You may have lost your status and your livelihood, and you're like a lost soul and you're homesick. It's it's a and I could see how even within a country moving, especially a country as large as America, or right, we have regional differences, you could feel exactly the same way. It's very disorienting. That's the word, disorienting. But I think nobody takes those those things ever whether it be immigrating or even just move, even even like you were saying moving your practice moving your house into uh -huh. a different neighborhood there's always this unsettling feeling and we don't give ourselves grace for that and i can't even imagine running for your life 
to a different country and not knowing what's going to happen with anybody else you've ever known, if they're going to survive or anything else, and then coming in and being ridiculed, that there it, that's going to place some anger deep down inside, whether you deal with it or not, because you're always going to remember those little traumas. You always do. Yes, they made my father actually, because it was it was the forties, and they made my father fight a Japanese boy or an Asian boy. I don't even know if he was Japanese. Yeah, they made him fight, you know, because it was you know it was the axis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. fight, and he felt like he had no choice. He had to beat up the other kid, and they sat there and they called him a Jap, and they called my father a Nazi, and they they circled him, and and that was um, you know, well, that's what kids do, you know. In the 70s, my grand my grandfather, who had been in World War II, um, we bought a Toyota. Yes. And too. yes, my my grandfather <laughs> had some yes, actually it was a silica, but yes, it, my grandfather had some choice words and called it a trap. But he put the first word there, and I will not say it. But that's not that's only me. And I understand you're you're making a point. But he would call it that. It's like that's we fought those people. That that is like really. And here's the really sad thing is when I moved to this town that I live in, which is about 9,000 people, uh, we went, my husband and I were like, let's go to this restaurant, get some local cuisine. We have to figure out some things. When we go there, the restaurant is set. It could be set in the sixties because we still have the hand towel in the bathroom, oh, you yes. know, the one that you pull through. Yes. yes. You know, that's so sanitary. <laughs> um, but the people at the lunch counter, the older people at the lunch counter are talking about people of Chinese descent and using stereotypical words. And I'm sitting there mortified because this is, I think, 2013. And this place was just like stepping into the 50s, 60s, where you they were just openly being racist. And I couldn't believe it because I thought, I thought we had progressed. Well, I got the rude awakening shortly after that, but you know, it was just one of those things where it's like, as much as we've progressed, we have started falling backwards and, and we don't look at everybody and say, okay, it goes back to what you were saying about Germany. Why can't everybody be equal? Why, why can't we have that equality? Why does everybody have to have that stereotypical little, little title, whether it's your country of origin or something else. Why are we still exactly. dealing with that after this? So what did you, how did you find out your dad was a spy? Did he tell you this or did you find it in his journals later? No, I mean, he had, first of all, the way he drove, <laughs> you would know that he had been an intelligence officer. He drove a manual transmission. I mean, it was very funny. He drove, you know, when everybody in America was driving, like this gigantic vehicle, like my my American grandparents and my father's side, a boat. On my mother's side drove a boat, you know, like some <laughs> giant Buick Impala or something. Mm -hmm. And then my father would pull up our, his first, our first car that I remember was called a Simca, which I think was French. Our second car was a Beetle. Um, mm -hmm. And our and our third car that I remember was a was a Corolla that we drove on air condition that we drove out west. He would always buy a stripped down stick shift. And then he would like, you know, race around like a little bug, you know, between cars. And he, I think he liked to do it on purpose because he felt, uh, you know, he felt, uh, I don't know, snazzy. <laughs> you, know, he, you know, it was uh, like, I guess, ma I never thought of him as macho, but I guess in a way that would be the way to describe it. Um and then he would tell us about his escapades, you know, being chased by the Russians or uh, or the East Germans. And so we knew uh, the, uh, the stories. But again, the, you know, when your parents regale you with stories, they do it when you're younger and then they tend not to repeat it when you're older. So then you, they're kind of vague memories and you don't really recall the details at all. So I had to go back when I reread his book and um kind of familiarize myself with all the the fun details of his I mean he was a young man he was 24 25 it was I think okay. it was a good time for him the except, question except is, when he got picked up and you know ar arrested and he thought he was going to be sent to a gulag and made to disappear <laughs> well that was not so much fun but no 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 did did um did you ever doubt his stories when you were little did you no. were thinking like oh dad's watched too many james bonds no. james bond movies no 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 he was always absolutely 
never doubted it at all. Always absolutely 100% truthful. I, I No, I don't doubt a thing. I believe you. I just know some parents yeah. are a little so outlandish that you're just going, mm -hmm. especially kids nowadays. If you tell them something I'm like, yeah, right. <laughs> but so he had a very interesting and amazing life. Did you get to, I take it you got to know your grandparents as well? Or did they? Uh, have, no. Have um, my, uh, my grandfather died before I was born. Um, my uh, grandmother, um, who had, you know, emigrated to this country was uh, a part of my life. She died when she was in her 80s and she was a good part of my life. And she was a tough grandmother in the sense that she was, you know, she was European and she had a heavy accent and she spoke a lot of like mixed German and English. And and I found her, she wasn't like a warm and fuzzy grandmother. Um, I think like, I don't know what people would consider like a typical Jewish grandmother, which would be like all warm and like, you know, bubby or whatever. I didn't have a, ever have a grandmother like that. She was, you know, she was strict and, you know, yeah, if we would go over to her house and she would make dinner, but there was there were portions <laughs> that I would come yeah. home and tell my parents I was still hungry. And it was just, it was a, that's a very German thing, by the way, to have like you have a specific portion and this is what you get and you don't ask for more and there are rules. It's just it's very it's really very German. They were more German than Jewish in their um, demeanor and, and behavior and their sensibilities. Um, without doubt and so um it i we live very close to my grandmother and um my father and she argued in german i absorbed some german somewhere in my head i didn't know i knew it because they didn't teach it to me but it was in there somewhere and um um but yeah i felt like i knew her well enough that, that when i had to put dialogue in the book it was I, I, it was easy. I, I knew it. Uh, I knew how to do it. I knew my aunt, um, who had a little bit of a different experience than my father. She was sent to England, um, in 1939 because they didn't have, they were not allowed to have visas for all four of them to get out. Uh, they felt that the, the, uh, consulate felt that there wasn't enough money to support all four of them here so they had to figure out who to sacrifice and um so but yes in terms of and, and my although i did not know my grandfather my father had described him well enough that i felt that i could portray him well he was the goofier dreamer not the disciplined worker he was uh, again, remember my grandmother thought she married beneath her because he wasn't so ambitious. Mm -hmm. He wanted somebody who was going to try to make it. And he was like, ah, <laughs> I'll have a beer or two and discuss more <laughs> stories with my friends at the bar. You know, that wasn't, you know, that wasn't a good work ethic for her. No, no. I mean, uh, fun is not okay in my family. No. Leisure well, is especially sloth. Especially the way you described your grandmother, I can see that not being, I can see the eye roll quite a bit for her going, uh, you need to get along with the, the program here and no, do but this. If it hadn't been for her, they never would have gotten out. She went to that consulate, consulate day in and day out and day in. Where are our visas? Where are our visas? Not knowing that uh, the uh, American State Department was intentionally holding them up. I've heard stories about yes. that. My, my well question is, yeah. Um, have you thought about telling your aunt's story? Because I mean, that is a different component to it. So my aunt's story is in the book and her story okay. is, is fascinating as well, because when my family was having difficulty getting to America and their visas weren't coming through and the war had already started, they had a backup plan that involved marrying my aunt off to a uh, Chinese um, engineering student who had been a, a, a had been a boarder B-O-A-R-D-E-R. In mm -hmm. um, my father's uncle, uh, an aunt had an apartment nearby. And um, they had a, a boarder to help pay the rent, who was this Chinese um, engineering student. And he was very enamored of uh, my father's sister, who was 
nine years his his elder. So she was a teenager. She was like 17. He was 34. And he made a proposal that he would get them visas to a northern uh, Chinese province if and only if um, she would marry him. And eventually that is what happened. And then they thought they were going to leave for China uh, through a, a, a ship that left from Genoa. And then Italy entered the war right before the ship left. And so the plans got dashed, but they were married already. Um, the marriage took place in England. So she had her own um, very traumatic story, much of which I, I could not get all the details from. I only got from what my father knew, and I'm not sure he knew everything. It was a story I would have liked some more co completion, um, but um, even her own children, my cousins who were alive and well, um, couldn't quite complete all the details with as much emotional content as I would have liked to give it. Um, but yeah, her story is in and of itself quite incredible. So now that the book is up for pre-sale and we'll talk about the, the title and everything and the link's going to be in the bio, what is your next project besides getting besides besides getting ballroom dancing taken care of if you haven't already <laughs> I and, a couple of courses <laughs> yeah. and um getting this in front of the government to get some kind of historic teaching in schools what are your next plans for this for this book well or, for or general, going but... forward with your author career so i actually started writing another book and i was halfway through it and I really want to keep writing because I actually enjoy the, the like the physical feeling of writing is gives me like a pleasure the way some people enjoy a massage. I don't like a massage because that requires relaxation. <laughs> and, and, and then my mind is running about all these things I have to do. So who can enjoy a massage when you have so many things to do? It's terrible. But when I'm writing, my mind is in some peaceful place not distracted by anything except I am in the book, literally, like I have entered the world of the book. So I started writing a book, a novel. It has nothing to do with the Holocaust. It is a, uh, a ensemble cast of people on a vacation, um, on a hiking trip together, people from all walks of life with all different personal situations. It's, it's both comical and it's a little sinister. And I really enjoy it, but I've had to put it on hold a little bit because I didn't realize that marketing a book is a whole job unto itself. And I had to learn these things I didn't know how to do, like make a website and go on social media, and do podcasts. <laughs> and I learned how to make a website, which is fun. I like to learn new things. So it was fun and I'm enjoying learning new things. And I, I actually, I guess I like being busy because, you know, the upbringing uh, so, yeah, so I feel like I have a, a, a whole job. So the writing, you know, of the other book, which is temporarily called The Climb, is on just a small hiatus. But I will get back to that as soon as I give this my entire heart and soul. Everybody thinks that writing is just writing. They don't realize everything else that goes into it. They just like, oh, well, you're a writer. OK, well, you're just writing a book. That's all. There's nothing else involved. Yeah. yeah okay <laughs> <laughs> it's been a it's been a learning experience but great all of it great I mean I really mm -hmm. like I think you know <laughs> when I stopped practicing medicine again I thought like well if I'm not Dr. Birnbaum I'm Mrs. Birnbaum but that's my mother-in-law so <laughs> how could I be Mrs. Birnbaum but it's fine I don't mind like I, I thought I would really mind not having the, the title and I suppose I could walk around saying you know I could have put MD after my name but I'm, I'm not practicing when I'm writing this book I don't need the MD after my name I could be something else and I'm now I can really feel like I am something else I did this thing and you know of course I want the book to be successful of course I do I could sit there and look at my numbers see like what are sales today did they drop but I always I'm trying to stay grounded and remember that my goal always was to share my father's story it's what he would have wanted and I think it it's really important and I think as long as I stay grounded in that and make sure that it might go my job is to tell the story that's it if if the book sells well I'm delighted but 
I had a career already. That's not the point. The point is to do something I love, to share the story, to educate. If I accomplish that, I will be in, in heaven. I really will be so happy. I think that's one of the biggest lessons as writers um, or authors is if you're getting in the business because you think you're going to make a million dollars selling books. Well, those days I don't think really happen unless you're a celebrity now. So you have to do it because number one, you're passionate about it. You're passionate about storytelling. And two, you want to share that story with the world. It doesn't matter the compensation because that's hit or miss. You have to do it for the right reasons. And it has to come from your heart because if the story doesn't come from your heart, even if it's somebody else's story you're relaying, people are going to know. Exactly. Are Isn't know. that a commercial venture where I'm, who's my target audience? Uh, I don't know. I don't have a target audience. And people who want to read it, that's my target audience. I hope they, exactly. Hope people want to read it. Exactly. I hope when they read it, they say, oh my God, that was great. You, know, you wrote that well. It was a great story. Um, I was moved. I think that's it. I was moved. You know, I, I cried when I wrote it. I hope people not just cry, but cry and laugh Be, you know I, I i really tried to infuse it with the humor that it re required it shouldn't feel like oh my god do I have <laughs> this is terrible i'm sure i'm sure it's an emotional roller coaster and that's a good thing because you want the highs you want the lows you want the experience when you're reading about somebody's life who had an amazing life because it sounds like it was a total complete journey so the book is American Wolf from Nazi Refugee to American Spy. It is available for pre-order now. It'll be out on the 23rd, correct? That is correct. Yes. So is there anything else that I didn't ask or cover that you would like to say something about? Oh, I think that I just did this for my father as a tribute to him. That was the major motivation, but now I'm doing it really for everybody else I, it's a book you know again that i hope that people enjoy with a message of hope i think that's also there's a message of hope and resilience that i think when people finish it they will say not like oh that was a holocaust story yeah that was sad but more like no this is something i could relate to this is about you know the triumph of the human spirit uh, so that's i think what i want to convey in more than anything and I hope people hope people love it. Um, thank you so much for having me and letting me share the story. Um, I don't really want I don't really want to talk about myself too much, but 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 thank you for letting right. me talk about myself. I appreciate that. Well, it's it's not only about the book; it's about getting to know who you are. So I thank you for your time. Thank you, Donna. Thank you so much. So it was an interesting interview. I think we touched upon what her dad did, and I think you know. I, I can understand the dad, you know, with the spy car and driving around, weaving in and out. The funny thing is my dad was a, a an operator on a fire truck. And the one thing that I, I find amusing, he did not teach me how to drive. Neither one of my parents did. But what I find amusing is the fact that my dad would lecture me about speeding when the man would speed. And I know he would. Um, but he was a fire truck operator. So, of course. So when you look at your parents and this is kind of going back to what we talked about in the podcast. When we look at our parents, we look at them as, in a certain way. And as we either have our own children or we get older, we are able to look at them with a different set of eyes to see their flaws, to see their human nature and to see maybe why their behavior patterns are what they are. You know, recently I've talked to somebody and discovered some of my genealogy. And because of that, I'm able to look at my parents and my grandparents a little bit differently. And that gives you a much better understanding of generational trauma. And I know we've touched upon that on the show before, but it's something that I think is very valid and very important. For most of us, we need to make sure that we don't just take our parents at face value. Yes, they are who they are. And yeah, in some points, they're not going to change. But if we can understand them better and even look at their journey like Audrey did. I mean, most of us don't get the luxury of having that journal. I was fortunate enough before my grandparent, my grandmothers died, not my grandfather's, but my grandmother's to sit down with a camcorder and actually record them telling me stories about their life and how they met my grandfather's and things of that nature. I haven't had that luxury with my father. It would have been great to do it. but because he has some great stories as a firefighter, but 
I'm not going to have that. So for you out there, if you're capable of sitting down with your parents or your grandparents, I advise you to do so because you never know what nuggets you might learn. You never know what stories you might find out. Um, my father-in-law would tell me stories that his kids didn't even know, but him and I were hanging out because my husband was in the hospital at the time and his wife was in the hospital. So we were both commiserating because we had nothing else to do. And he would tell me these stories, these amazing stories of him as a younger man in the Navy. And he was married. So it wasn't anything, it wasn't anything illicit, but he would tell me these stories about, you know, being, being too intoxicated and being on autopilot when he came home. And I know this isn't funny, but he was on the base and driving to the ship because he was on autopilot. So it's, it's those little amusing stories that his kids never knew. And they're like, my dad didn't drink. My dad had one beer and that was it. Well, no, there's a whole side of our parents that we don't know. And if we don't take those moments to really dig into who they are, we may lose a gift of figuring out some things about our own selves because that is passed on to each of us. So her book, once again, is American Wolf from Nazi refugee to American spy. I think, you know, you should check it out. It is at the time of this podcast, we recorded the podcast when it was still in pre-order but now at the air date it is available for purchase so i advise you to check it out it should be an interesting read she wrote it with heart she wrote it with soul tears happiness and everybody needs a good cry and a good laugh at the same time so i hope today you enjoy the show as always and i hope you have a great day and i'll catch you next time guys bye <laughs> The Better Two Podcast is mixed, edited, and produced by Rich Zai of Third Ear Audio Productions. 